During the revolution, Linden incurred several raids by the British stationed on Staten Island. The proximity as well as harsh winters, which the Arthur Kill was completely frozen over, made the Rawway Meadows and Tremley Point sections of Elizabethtown, now Linden, an inviting prospect for pillaging cattle and capturing patriots off guard, as we discussed in our video on Captain Hatfield and his cousin. These incursions were often met with action from the Patriot men in Linden, but this was not always the case. There are recorded instances of brave Patriot ladies of Linden foiling the British and Loyalists during these times as well. Thanks to the stellar history of Linden, research and written by Lauren Pancheric Yeats, resource for parts in several of these Truth About Colonial Linden videos, I was made aware of one specific heroine in Linden's struggle against the Crown. Adding to the praise of our female Lindenites, I have uncovered a more general account of common actions taken by the ladies of Linden throughout the struggle for New Jersey. I will share a Hessian Journal entry we highlighted in our Voices of the Last Invasion series. I will start with the writings of Hessian officer Johann Ewald. He discusses the Hessian perspective on dealing with the Patriots across the kill. Though the term harness nest is often attributed to the backwoods of the Carolinas, the term was, was first used in early 1777 to describe the Patriots directly across the Arthur Kill in New Jersey, from the area of Woodbridge to Elizabethtown Point. Several miles of this foreboding area to the Hessians was today's Linden. In our Voices project, we quoted Ewald's thoughts on the men of Essex militia. Alas, not all the Hornets were men. Though women were not in the fight during these forge battles, our sisters used the relative safety of their gender during this time to aid the cause significantly. It is noted by Ewald, as well as in other correspondence, British and American, that when British forces encroached onto the New Jersey side of the kill, it happened that many militiamen were not at home. As the conflict progressed, Cornelius and his cousin Smith made sport of capturing patriots sleeping at their homesteads. Militia units began remaining in groups close to their homes, moving from homestead to homestead as to defend from the Loyalist raids. One night at one homestead, one night at another. So often wives would be holding down the farms alone and the first to be aware of enemy movements. This sacrifice and courage alone is highly admirable. These Lady Lindenites, though a severe civil war between Patriot and Tory forces was happening, knew that they were at much lower risk of atrocity from the professional British and Hessian troops. And though the risks certainly rose from vengeful Tories, they in almost all cases shared kinship with at least one of the Tories raiding. This eliminated any tolerance of barbary towards female patriots in virtually all cases of these raids as far as we have uncovered. Supporting this, we highlighted in our Clark family video that Abraham Clark's wife, Sarah Clark, born Sarah Hatfield, was Captain Hatfield, the most prolific Tory raider's cousin. And this was most likely why the Clark farm that straddled today's Roselle and Linden was not burnt during the revolution. Also in support is the murder of Hannah Caldwell, which on the surface would seem to dispel this assertion that no random acts towards women tended to occur. However, our deduction found most likely that this was an ordered act of barbarism, not a random one. Though despicable in every way, in reality, this was a very rare occurrence. Now these Lady Lindenites and would-be scouts used this to boldly raise alarms to incoming raids, usually waiting till a party passed their farm then go outside and fire a musket into the air as a warning. This would be heard by adjoining farms, and then another woman of a nearby farm would do the same. Thus, their Minutemen husbands, who were within what is now Linden, would not only be made aware of the incursion, but also could gauge the general path of the expedition, thus being able to mount defense at the most advantageous point along the raiding party's path. I was not able to uncover if there was any further coding that would make the Minutemen aware of pertinent information, such as troop strength or type of unit, but it is likely that at least some husband-wife teams did employ such measures. These women helped hold the longest-held front line in the war in a very meaningful way. It appears Lady Lindenite's actions during the war were not only relegated to this sort of reconnaissance. In reading Yeats' history, I was made aware of another bold action, taken alone by one Mary Alston Marsh. I will paraphrase an account of this action from the Linden Observer, Thursday, October 17, 1940. In one raid into Linden, the British took a pet heifer belonging to pretty Mary Alston Marsh, daughter of Moses Marsh, one of Linden's first settlers. In true Linden fashion, she would have none of it. 
Acting quickly, she defied the scoundrels by successfully stampeding the confiscated cattle. The cattle scattered chaotically in all directions, trampling a few redcoats in the process. Pull in the face! By the time the redcoats were able to react, all the cattle had fled, and Mary was safely on the way home with her prized pet heifer. The British foraging party limped back to Staten Island entirely empty-handed and worse for wear. Not all the hornets here were men, and it seems the strength, resilience, and resourcefulness of the women of Linden is not a modern happening. In fact, it has always been part of the Lindenite culture. Thanks for watching this Truth About Colonial Linden episode. I'm Phil Zabo. I'll see you next time. Uh -huh.